I'm, I'm listening to these great sessions today, and they get very technical around you know the security versus utility versus app coin. Um, for the next 10 minutes, I really encourage everyone in this room to put aside Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and ICOs, and let's just talk about trust. And let's talk about trust as a business model. I usually start this with a very simple question. I promise it is not a trick question. What is the color of my shirt? So anyone sitting in this room Right? could probably take a look at me and say, well, I know the answer to that. So it's a very simple question to answer when you gather your own data. Now imagine someone sitting outside of this room needing to need, needs to answer the exact same question. What is the color of Kesem's shirt? Well, how do they do it if they're not in the room? Obviously, they ask you. And we have just taken a very simple problem and we have made it an order of magnitude more com complicated. Now the person that is not in this room needs to go through this mental checklist of questions. Do they know you? Do they trust you? Do you have any incentive, financial or otherwise, to throw them off? Do you have a track record of, of being you know, dishonest? It's much, much, much more complicated to trust when you don't gather your own data. Well, this is exactly the problem that the blockchain helps us solve. The blockchain for the very first time allows us to trust data that we do not own. This is a huge advancement. It was never possible before we had a blockchain. And very similar to that, we could talk about smart contracts. Like blockchain allows us to trust data points that we do not own, smart contracts allow us, allow us to trust logic we did not code. I can now, I now have a very efficient mechanism to trust a program that I didn't write, knowing with certainty it will do what it's supposed to do. When you take these two things together, together trusting data you don't own and logic you didn't code, you could start talking about how do you take whole business cases, whole businesses actually, and onboard them to a blockchain. And that's exactly what Nuco does. Nuco's mission is essentially to bridge the gap between this novel, really new and early stage technology called blockchain and big enterprise. We are here to make blockchains essentially, uh, um, let's call it a foundational fabric. So it drives the functionalities and services we all come to expect out of the modern world. And the way we do it is by developing our own stack that you are uh, free, and, and actually I would encourage you to download today. We are a part of something called EEA. When we started this company, again, only two years ago, um, the notion that you would need a blockchain for enterprise, we were re regarded as, as crazies. Why do I need something special when I could just download off the internet for free kind of a thing, right? In the last two years, that conversation changed fun fundamentally. Uh, we now have, you know, we have in the room folks like R3, IBM, and obviously DEA that we helped put together with the biggest brands in the world buying into the fact that they need their own kind of a blockchain, an enterprise-centric blockchain. Um, I'm going to walk you very quickly through a use case that we've uh, co-developed with the TMX, but before I do that, I wanted to provide you with a snapshot of our portfolio. And the reason I'm doing it is, again, blockchain is not, is not a financial technology. Anyone in this room saying, okay, I'm an investor, and how do I return, you know, calculate my return on the ICO, and how much is the coin going to be worth? Fine, but you're doing it wrong. It's really about what the blockchain facilitates. It's really about why you need the blockchain to begin with. This portfolio shows you where we have applied blockchains to many different domains that are not necessarily financial. The use case that I want to share with you actually doesn't have a cryptocurrency. There is no token, there is no coin, it doesn't even touch money or payments. We worked with the TMX group, this is early last year, 
around their NGX business model. NGX is the natural gas exchange. They facilitate, I think, around 95% of the flow of natural gas in Canada. We here are obviously huge net exporters of commodities, energy being one of the biggest sectors. And it's a really simple you know, use case. It's, it's a very simple logic. Uh, there is a seller and a buyer, supply and market, and as long as they agree on the terms of the contract, gas flows. Simple, right? Well, this is where it gets more tricky. The seller and the buyer are the original contract, but all of these uh, uh, commodities are essentially traded as futures, right? This is me buying gas from you to be delivered by Christmas. By the time Christmas came around, you might have turned around and shortened your position, hedged it, speculated, I don't know. It's very rare that the original person that touched the contract is the person to get delivery at the end of the, of the term. And now you could maybe start seeing why this is a bit more problematic. And I will always point to this example when thinking through, do I even need a blockchain? If you have any business logic out there that requires multiple stakeholders that don't necessarily know each other, they all want to be in business with each other, but they don't trust each other blindly, and nor should they, that's probably a good use case. That is probably meeting the first criteria of when you should think around a blockchain-based solution. So very quickly, just, just to point out the biggest pain points with, with what happened. We now have a fragmented value chain, right? Because it's not A and B, it's A and B and C all the way through Z. Um, we have an inherent challenge because these people don't necessarily know each other. I only know the person I bought from and sold for. I don't know who else is on the value chain. So you have a lot of ambiguity in terms of who are the parties involved anyways. Uh, it is incredibly tricky to pass information. So you start with a contract that has, I don't know, let's say five underlying kind of questions, right? Uh, who are the parties? What are they selling for? How much? When is it to be delivered? Quantity. Try to pass a very simple message around this room in a model where one person whispers in the ear of the person sitting next to them, see how fundamentally different that message comes on the other end. It's really hard to pass information when you're dealing with such a convoluted value chain. And lastly, this is natural gas we're talking about. It's an incredibly tricky commodity. What we are literally talking about free-flowing molecules. How do you track something? And, and this is probably where, where I'll, I'll conclude this use case. The number you're seeing above me, that's a real number. That's an exchange quoted number. When a chain breaks today, when somebody didn't fulfill their role and gas did not flow, it takes 60 to 90 days to reconcile. That is incredibly expensive. And again, I, I, I'll leave it. I, I know there are some TMX people in the room. I'll leave it to them if you want to have that conversation. What did we do for them? We onboarded the entire value chain. So from the contracting all the way down to the final delivery, so the entire clearing process, we have onboarded to a blockchain. The result, many results, the so what that you should take with you, we took this 60 to 90 day number to two minutes. This is three orders of magnitude better, and that is exactly the kind of opportunity that a blockchain represents in the context of any business scenario. Okay, what's missing? So if blockchains are so great, and this is, this is a debate I have often, why isn't everything on a blockchain, right? Why, why do I, when I log on to my bank, and my bank tells me I have $5, I need to look at it and say, eh, I guess that makes sense. But I'm actually you know, blindly trusting my bank, right? Why is it not blockchain-based? And I'll give you a couple of reasons but probably the biggest thing to take away from here is a word that not a lot of people use, interoperability. And, and let me make the case why this is the big new frontier for startups in the blockchain space to really solve for. Blockchains today are fantastic. To, they do away with silo databases. They're very effective, very cost effective. It, it, aligning, misaligned interest. If I have a reason not to trust you, a blockchain is very good at enforcing trust. They're fantastic for simplifying convoluted business processes, and, and they do that today. 
Where they struggle is the concept of interoperability, scalability, how do we make it faster and more performant, and privacy. Do I actually want everyone to see my data and my client's data because a blockchain is an open system? Interoperability is probably the biggest problem to solve, and, and here's why, here's the case. Here is a portfolio of networks, blockchains that Nuco has developed for its clients. The TMX guys, again, let, let's pick at TMX. When, when we did the, the natural gas use case with them, they asked us, fine, you could reconcile very quickly on natural gas. What about crude oil? What about liquefied gas? What about agriculture commodities? And the answer was yes, yes, yes. As long as you have the same business logic, it, it doesn't matter to the blockchain what you're representing digitally on it. You could represent anything. But then they asked us, okay, what happens when two of our clients settle on a commodity and we want that to trigger a payment event coming, let's say, from the TD blockchain? Could blockchain A talk to blockchain B? And that's where the conversation got sidetracked because technically it is incredibly hard to bridge blockchains. When you think about it in common sense, if we already have all these uh, great use cases of where blockchains, you know, they, they're just the best, best tool for the job, the way that we could actually unlock the full potential is the, way, is the day that we could actually make them speak to each other. If I could actually trigger events on other blockchains, not other than myself, by being decentralized, that would be a big advancement. Anyone in the room owning Bitcoin, Think of how you take that Bitcoin and buy anything else. You want to buy Ether, you, what, what, you want to buy Litecoin, whatever it might be. You actually go from a purely digital asset on a blockchain, you go off chain, you go through an exchange, you have to trust the exchange to be able to go back on chain. That's a market failure. That's a market failure with a very, very um, straightforward, though complex, technical fix. The thinking, and again, this is a very quick thought exercise, is that the go between any two blockchains has to be a blockchain itself. That is the only way that we could preserve the benefits that, that led us to a blockchain to begin with. And our solution to this problem is called Aeon. It's a project that we have launched last year. Um, and quite simply, to keep it in layman's terms, allows us to do this. It allows us to take all these disparate networks and interconnect them. And because you can connect, interconnect different networks, you're actually solving for scalability. If you have a network that's too busy, build another one and offload. That's pretty much how the internet works. Um, we were pretty successful with this project. We've raised $27 million last year. Um, and we are now pretty much in the midst of making Aeon a reality, meaning we have already launched the testnet and the mainnet of the Aeon blockchain is coming online uh, in a month. So it's an exciting time for us. I'll leave you with two thoughts. When thinking about blockchain's future, this is really the picture that you should have. It is not the case. It is not the case that there will be one triumphant fabric. IBM will have a piece of the blockchain business. Grant and the R3 folks will have a piece of the blockchain business. They have a phenomenal product. Ethereum will remain a thing. It's not going to be one stack that runs everything. And because we are going to have multiple, a multitude of different blockchains doing different things. The question that everybody needs to ask is, okay, how are all these different networks going to talk to each other? The vision, and, and I'll conclude with that, is that any of these commercial entities or even the open source community, so this includes Bitcoin, Ethereum, Zcash, R3, Hyperledger, and, and the list goes on and on and on, they all have to be part of the same fabric for blockchain to become a reality. Thank you so much, guys.